do it, but shit. Oh my god. All right, back on our heads, right? Back on our heads. Here's your key terms. We're gonna go over this flight computer. It's not gonna take a lot of time. I'm going to describe some of the things that you could do with the flight computer. And then we will go through one or two examples and, and leave it alone. Again, tomorrow we'll go through navigation and the idea is that we'll actually plan a flight. A very, very simple flight, a short flight. We'll give you a, a, a couple of conditions and we'll, we'll plan that flight to go from one area of South Florida to another, okay? All right, so computer side, wind side, that's just here I got a flight computer. That's the computer side, it says computer on it, right? And then that's the wind side. So anytime that I'm trying to calculate wind correction angles and ground speeds or how the airplane is being affected by the wind and the atmosphere, this is the side I'll use. That has instructions typically written on the flight computers at the very top of them, yeah, right there. Six steps, six steps to success is what I call it right there. You follow those six steps, cannot go wrong. Believe me when I tell you that, all right? Okay, uh, speed index. That is the little index across the top for those of you that are looking at it, of uh, the, the little arrow. This arrow right here, the rate index, that little index, that's your speed index. Speed of anything, speed of the airplane or speed of how much fuel I'm consuming per hour. Okay, so that's a rate index. All right. A scale, B scale, these are on the, outs, these are on the uh, outside here, A scale and B scale. C scale on the inside, we'll talk about it. The C scale is just a convenient way for me to change from uh, minutes to hours and minutes. Hour scale, wind correction angle on the back, headwind, tailwind, crosswind component. We've already talked a little bit about headwind and tailwinds and crosswinds. Well, Solve for that right here on the wind side. The azimuth plates, true index, and wind dot. Look at the back side. If you guys got that all downloaded on your, on your apps, look at that back side of the, the wind, the wind scale, right? Do you see the one that says true index across the top? Uh-oh, okay. And so it says true index across the top. This side is for wind, remember, okay? That wind is relation to the true wind, the true north. This is not a magnetic index. So remember that your winds are described in true. And for me to use this calculator, I need to have a true course. Easy enough for us in the private pilot program because I have a sectional chart and I'll have my true course. But just remember when you start using instrument charts, those are normally magnetic. They're expressed in magnetic de degrees. So I have to use true course. If it's a true index, make sure that everything I'm using is true course. This is the flight computer. Density altitude window in the middle. I have my, my pressure altitude on the outside. Look what's opposite pressure altitude, temperature. In degrees Celsius, and the temperature in degrees Celsius is listed positive on the left side, negative on the right side. That becomes a challenge for pilots in the beginning. They say they, they typically will use uh, different sides of that scale, the wrong side. They'll use negative over here and positive over here. Just look at your unit. It's a negative here. It has a plus over there. Then you have your air temperature window. There's an air temperature window that I slide against and the pressure side below it, okay? The speed index is nothing more than just, did anyone not have an opportunity to download that? Because I got a couple of these too. But the speed index is nothing more than just 
that arrow, okay? An A scale is on the outside. B scale is the first movable scale that I have, okay? So A scale and B scale are adjacent to one another. The C scale, as I mentioned before, is on the inside. And the only thing this allows me to do a little bit differently than the, the A and B scale is change from hours to, or excuse me, change from minutes to hours and minutes. All right? So I can change, if I show on the uh, B scale, I show 90 minutes. It'll allow me to rapidly look at that and determine that 90 minutes is an hour and a half. Okay? Well, that's an easy one. But if you come up with 223 minutes, it's easy to use that C scale and turn that into something that I can use 223. Okay? All right. Across the bottom, you've got a Fahrenheit and Celsius scale. One of these is my favorite, and that is minus 40. Because minus 40 is the same no matter what side of the earth you're on. Celsius or Fahrenheit. Okay? The unit index is on the top. This is interesting. These two tens that you see on the top, this will allow you to multiply and divide and not use a calculator. So yes, I can multiply and divide using this machine, using this system, no batteries required, okay? Everybody has phones these days, so it's not that useful and we no longer use it, okay? All right, here we go. Exercise. I want everybody just to take your flight computer. I got some paper ones out there. We should have them all on our apps. Observe how the computer works. Just quickly, we're gonna set the index, the unit index on the inner scale, the B scale, under 90. We're multiplying nine by eight. What's important here to understand is that where you see the nine, it's either 0.9, 9, 90, 900, 9,000, it doesn't matter what multiple of 10 we have. It is all the exact same answer. Right? That's a hard one to swallow. I know I got some new eyes up here. 0 0.9, 0 0.09, 9, 90, 900, 9,000, anything that starts with the nine and these are either is preceded or has after it a bunch of zeros, that is the exact same, okay? So if I'm trying to multiply nine by eight, I have to use my 90, because you could go all the way around this scale and try to find a nine, you won't find it, okay? Now look above 80 on the B scale. Here's my B scale. Looking above 80 on the B scale, I know that it points to 7.2. Look, 70. 7.1, 7.2. So 9 times 8 is 72. Something that we need to know right away about flight computers, and, and I'm honestly not going to spend a whole lot of time on it because we need to get to things that probably have a little more pertinence to us like navigation and we got to talk about VORs but something that we need to know right off the bat is look at the way these scales are these scales are the exact same the, the A scale and the B scale parallel each other precisely but the difference is how close what the proximity is between each different digit. So 10 to 11, for instance, those are very, very close together. 35 to 40, these are spread apart a little bit. This is 10, that's 11. 35, 36, right? 37. The scales work in a very unique way. 
And each one of these lines in between the scales could be a different interval. If I look at 17 here, I got 17 and 18. This is 17.2468 and then 17, okay? So 16.2.4. If I come back here to 10, I got 10.1234567.8. Do you guys observe that slight difference? If you do, great, fantastic. If you don't, don't lose sleep over it. There are other ways that we can do this. However, having your flight computer skills is kind of like showing up and saying, hey, look, I can do this too, All right? It's just, this is more of a bragging right than it is anything else. Because when everybody else is fumbling around trying to look for something with batteries, you're already done, you got the answer, okay? All right, take a look at this. I can multiply any number by nine without changing the computer. I already got it set to nine. If I want to find uh, 81, right? Nine by nine, it's 81, right there. You already got it set to nine, so any number that I want to multiply times nine, I just find that number, and I got my answer. Okay, <clears throat> dividing. This is an exercise in the A scale and the B scale. How to get me used to the A scale and the B scale. If I understand how to use the A scale and the B scale, then getting your times and your fuel consumptions and your ground speeds and everything else is easy. If you don't understand this, when we get to the point and we're trying to find the fuel consumption or we're trying to find how long it will take for me to fly a certain amount of distance, we're just gonna continue by because honestly, it's just bragging rights, okay? All right, so how to divide. Place the number you wanna divide on the A scale above the number you're dividing on the B scale. So now I put these two together. For example, I'm gonna divide 48.5 by 33. Can I do that in my head? Not too easy, I can get an idea. I can come up with a swag. But we get better than a swag here. Just place 48 and a half over 33. So find your 48 and a half here and rotate that B scale until 33 is sitting just under it. Then I go to that 10 index and I read the answer 14.7. Every time, it's wonderful. Now, don't be surprised. What I find is that about 2% of pilots are going to even know how to use this thing in the first place. And out of those 2%, <coughs> probably only 1% of them are going to remember how and continue to use it. All right? So if we start moving fast, it's okay. That side and that side. You can do these two slides. You can do every other calculation we do. If I'm dividing, line these two numbers that I want to divide here. The one on top divided by the one on the bottom. Exactly how I'd write it. And then read above the 10. Now then, let's take a look. Let's do something that's a little, more, a little bit more aviation related. Let's take 33.5 nautical miles and let's do that in 18 minutes. Now number one, allow me please to set the stage. And the stage is this, you have a flight plan that you've created and you knew that you were gonna fly from this point to that point, and that distance was exactly 33.5 miles, okay? So you passed this point and you started your timer, or you continued the time, you just recorded what the timer had on it, and then continued so that you'd know the difference to when you get to the next point. You get to your next point, what do I know 100% for sure? I know how much distance that was, and I know how much time it took because I just measured it. 
What do I not know? Well, I, you're right. I probably don't know the wind speed, and that's what I'm trying to get. But I don't know my average ground speed, okay? I know the speed that I have on the indicator, probably 120. But I don't know how much I was flying across the ground. The only thing, and I can't get instantaneous speed, but if I didn't change my speed very much, I'm going to consider any changes negligible, and I'll say, you know what? I accept this as an average ground speed. And here's my average ground speed. Number one, set these two across. Given two landmarks and find ground speed, distance in, and distance in three hours. So number one, two, read your ground speed right there over the rate index. Remember I said rate was anything over that 60 index? The dividing was the 10. This one is the rate. In this case, it's 112 knots. So I know wherever that line is, wherever that index exists, there is my 11.2 or 112 or 1,120. It could be anything. Tens don't matter. But I know that I put a sniff test to it. The sniff test is if it smells like poop, it's poop. Okay? If I say that we're flying at 11.2 nautical miles per hour, that's not right. We're not even in the air at 11.2. If you tell me we're flying 1,120 knots, pff, no, but I know it's flying 112. That sounds right. So that last step, and they never put it in the books, is make sure you smell it and see if it smells like poop. All right. Then the next checkpoint will say it's 16 nautical miles away. Fine. I have my rate set here. If my rate is set here, just go on that A scale until it shows 16. Opposite 16 is my time, 8.6 minutes. If I were flying at 1,120 knots, well, then I would do 16 miles in uh, <laughs> 0.86 minutes, right? If I was flying 11.2 knots, then it would take me 160 minutes. So the tens will make a difference, but it has to smell, has to smell right. It has to make common sense. All right, number four, how many nautical miles do I cover? Let's say, for instance, I want to say, all right, 45 minutes is my fuel reserve. I'm flying at nighttime. I needed 45 minutes for my fuel reserve. What's the farthest that I can plan for this fuel reserve in order to get to another place. Well, all right, 45 minutes, put it on the B scale, right there. How far is this? Is this eight miles? No, I'm traveling 112. Not eight miles, 80 something, that makes sense. Is it 800 miles? No. So there I go, boom, 84. Get all of these answers without batteries. C scale is longer time periods. So like I said, if I wanna convert some time, some large number of minutes, 140, 108, 237 minutes. I don't, I have the foggiest clue what 237 minutes means, but tell me in hours and minutes and I got a really good idea. So here the example is, uh, let's say I was gonna go three and a half hours. Well, three and a half is there. And they come across how many nautical miles? 390. So the C scale is for much, much longer periods of time. And you're welcome. Is this thing awesome or what? The thing is absolutely magical. Fuel consumption. Guess what? Rate of travel, rate of consumption. It's all a rate. So something per 60 minutes. Okay. Fuel required over two hours. Here, I set my 8.5 gallons per hour. That is reasonable. That's a 172 fuel consumption. I usually call it 10. You know why I call it 10? Because 10 is easy, right? If I'm using 10 gallons per hour and I think I'll be in the air for another hour and 15 minutes, then I know I got 13 gallons of fuel I'll use. That's just quick, quick mental math, right? Just real quick swag. But 8.5, I, I got that out of the AFM off the charts. I say, okay, 8.5 fuel required for two and a half hours. 
18.4 gallons. Easy, easy, easy stuff, okay? All right, I gotta, I gotta tell you guys something and you reminded me of something, this is kind of cool. So in radio communication, never, said the word, right? Never, never say repeat. Do you know what repeat means? Okay, I'm gonna give you guys a little background. So radio communication, I'm talking with ATC, right? What am I speaking over? I'm speaking over a, a federal FM station, right? The, FC, the FCC, the Federal Communication uh, Center will, will uh, uh, manage all these communications. And I'm speaking to someone from the Department of Transportation. So that's a government radio frequency and it's a government communication. The word repeat in the US government, okay, means process the last fire mission. It means whatever you just shot, shoot it again. So you don't say the word repeat on the radio, but it's funny because we get over in the United States, every now and then I'll hear somebody on the radio, oh, could you please repeat? And I'm like, ah, don't say that. <laughs> Nobody's gonna shoot anything, but the proper term is say again. <laughs> Anyways, all right, fantastic. We're not okay with this? I thought we are gonna be great. Where are we falling apart? Just for a minute, where are we falling apart? Nowhere? Fuel? I just did. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, how about this, how about this? Fair enough, fair enough, new sheet. Somebody give me a fuel consumption rate, something that is uh, realistic for, for, a, uh, for an airplane. 12.7, are we okay with that? Okay, 12.7, okay. What's the units? Gallons per hour, okay. Now, Let's do this. Let's calculate how long, or how, excuse me, let's calculate how much fuel we will use for a trip, okay? Does that sound fair? So I'm gonna say that's my fuel consumption rate. I'm gonna tell you right now that we're traveling 348 nautical miles. Are we okay with that? Where did I come up with that number? You ever heard, pulled it out my butt? No, that's exactly what I did. I just came up with that number out of the blue, okay? Now, how fast are we flying? Thank you, 120, all right? Because that's my favorite. So the rest of this gets easy because I could tell you already how much it is. But 120 knots, true airspeed, okay? We're gonna work this out with some wind, but for the time being, Let's say there's no wind, okay? You know what else you also see that same exact day? A unicorn, okay? Because <laughs> it doesn't exist. There's always wind. Okay, you guys ready? Let's do it. I'm gonna get out my flight computer and we'll all do this together. Now my screen is not terribly big, but it's all right. I think we could see. So aviation here, let me get to flight computer. I'm gonna warm up, get to where it does. Here we go. What am I gonna solve for first? Well, hopefully, the very first thing I'll solve for is how long does this trip take me? Okay, so I'm gonna slide my wheel. You see that arrow? I'm gonna slide that wheel until it gets to my favorite airspeed, 120. Boom, right there. You guys see it? I had it zoomed in nice to 120. Okay. Is anyone not there? Okay, now I'm gonna do something called lock. Okay. <laughs> Pro version. I know because I, I'm usually standing up here and then I got all, I don't even know what up here, okay? You guys don't, okay. So that's what I'm gonna do. Now, the next thing I do is I find 
348 nautical miles. So I'm gonna look again on the A scale, on the outside scale, and I'll find something that looks like 345, 348, okay? I'm gonna find 300, I find 350, and I look somewhere between the two and I consider how is this thing counting? How are these little increments behaving? I got 31, two, three, four, so 310, 320, 330, 340, 348, just right here. Just a sliver between these two, okay? Now on the B scale, I see 175, almost 176. It's time, so I'm gonna round up, I'll express up. Because if anything, I wanna be a little off by a longer time, so I'm carrying more fuel, right? So I'm gonna to go to 176, 176 minutes. How long is that? I don't know. Well, it's pretty close to three hours. It's about two hours and 40 minutes or so. Pretty close. All right. So I know how much time it takes. Follow me for a second, okay? Look what I do. I'm gonna unlock, because I'm changing my rate. I'm not looking at 120 any longer. I want that same time, but I need to figure out how much for 12.7 gallons per hour is my new rate. So that same exact time, and I move this until it reads 12.7. Well, I don't have to move it far. Look, 12.7. Lock it. Come right back to that time. Here it is. My time was almost two hours and 40 minutes. There's how much fuel I'll consume. 36. Uh, maybe almost 36 and a half gallons per hour, okay? Or gallons total. You guys agree it's somewhere around 36? Am I pretty close? So 36 gallons. Are we close? No? Yes? No? Good? Uh, on which one? Okay, everybody, everybody, pay attention for a second. What do we got? Uh, so, uh, we, we can that same time. Same time. Yeah, whatever time you had, just go right across that time, and then go to your A scale. That's that's your fuel consum fuel consumed. Yes. Twelve point seven. Yep. Yeah. And remember, it was only going to take us almost two hours and forty minutes to get there. So on the bottom side now, go to two hours and 40 minutes. Uh, yeah, set that right, 12.7. And then on that bottom side, all right up there, yeah, exactly. Uh, right here, 36, okay? Okay, all right, everybody for a second, take a look. Take a, take a look at what we got. I want, I want you to guys to think for a little bit about this little crazy story, okay? How fast am I going? How long does it take me to go this far? I'm doing two miles a minute, so take this and cut it in half. How much is that? 174, am I close? I think so, I don't do math in public, it's embarrassing. 174, right? How much is 174, kinda? Is that three hours almost? Three times 12. All right, that is what's magical. If you can do that, then you've got the rest of it. It's fine, okay? This chapter, in the very, very, very beginning, 
It talks about the teams of people that are used to send Apollo out to space and dozens and dozens of mathematicians and calculators. And, oh, how did we mess up the Hubble uh, experiment? What's that? Yeah, wrong. There was a wrong computation. Somebody was using metrics. Somebody was using. Yeah. So, yeah, even that can go wrong. All right. What I promise you is not going to go wrong is that if you use that common sense, if you say, look, I'm doing two miles a minute, I'm going this far, cut it in half. That's how long it's going to take me. Yeah, real quick. How many hours is that? Multiply this by it. I know how much fuel I need. You are at that point in time, what's called in the ballpark. Okay. As long as you're in the ballpark, you can play ball. It doesn't have to be exact. Okay. If you can get pretty close, it's fine. Where it gets wrong is if you're in a different ballpark, <laughs> all of a sudden you come up, oh yeah, that's only, that's going to take me three gallons to get there. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. We have problems. Okay. Cause we, or if you say it's going to take you 300 gallons, cause the airplane doesn't even take 300 gallons. All right. So we you got some problems there. All right. Uh, now one thing that I need to mention, and I know this is a common error. And I think we got another slide that kind of goes over it a little bit. One feature on this flight computer that catches people's attention is all of the stuff on the outside that says nautical statue, fuel, oil, imperial gallons. Everybody wants to look at that stuff. Don't even look at it. Don't even think that it's there to do anything that we just now did, because as far as you're concerned, it doesn't exist. It's not even on that flight computer. Now at the bottom, you've got a nice one. I mentioned it was a Fahrenheit and Celsius conversion table. All of these other things are conversion tables. Don't look at them. Okay. But if I want to convert nautical to statute miles, I just read what's under this and under that. That's it. Nautical miles in this example is 74. And that converts over here to 85 on statute miles. Okay. If I want to find pounds to kilos and liters and gallons, don't look at any of that stuff. It's not real. It's not even there. That's the unicorn. It, it just don't even assume that it's not there at all. Okay. All right. Now, Let's go across. Talk air density for a moment. <sighs> if you guys thought that last one was fun, this one's fun too. This is even better. What are the different air speeds? Indicated air speed. What's indicated air speed? The one that you read directly off the indicator. Okay. Indicated altitude right off the indicator. Indicated air speed right off the indicator. All right. What other kind of airspeeds do I have? I have indicated airspeed. I'll go then to calibrated airspeed. Where do I find this thing? In the AFM, there's a table. It will show you for whatever indicated airspeed you have, this is the corresponding calibrated airspeed. They're normally very, very close, especially if you're in cruise configuration, as in flaps up and normal static air. And in the cruise configuration near cruise speed, that's where the pitot tube was designed to indicate accurately. When I start slowing the airplane, when I start extending flaps, when I start using alternate static sources, this is when my indicator doesn't show exactly the same as what I should get. And there's a calibration table to allow for that position error, right? So I got indicated airspeed, calibrated airspeed. What's another one that I have? That's how fast the airplane is actually going through the air, which could be way different than what you see on your indicator. Okay. When you get to the flight levels, when you start getting into air speeds where compressibility occurs, you may indicate a completely different airspeed besides how fast you're actually going through the air, but it's predictable. So there are tables and charts that allow us, to make the computations and show what the airspeed actually is. Okay. That's your true airspeed. The tables and charts that we'll use are right here. You guys hold the key to success right there in this pressure altitude window. Take the pressure altitude, place it underneath your 
temperature in Celsius, and then you read the true airspeed opposite your calibrated airspeed. And density airspeed is in the middle. All right, let's follow along on the same example that they have here. First step in calculating true airspeed, convert temperature to Fahrenheit, whatever. All right, we got this. All right, well, so we're at Celsius. Most computers have this conversion shown on the bottom. Two, second step, convert indicated altitude to pressure altitude by setting 29.92 in your altimeter. So I have 29.92 in my altimeter. What did I say the difference was usually in that? 100 feet, 200 feet. Can you read 200 feet difference here? No, so don't lose sleep, don't start panicking because I don't have 29.92 in my altimeter. All right, read what the altimeter indicates right there. Take that indicated altitude and place it opposite your temperature. In this case, I have 20 degrees Celsius. Remember the positive sides on the left, the negative sides on the right. So 20 degrees over 8,000. Everybody do that on your calculator and just don't move anything afterwards. So eight is five, six, seven, eight, and place that directly under the 20 degrees. I got an indicated outside air temperature gauge. I have an altimeter gauge. All of this stuff is coming off the flight deck. Now, don't move the flight computer and convert your indicated airspeed to calibrated using the chart. In this case, we have 106 knots. So find 106 knots on the B scale. 106 knots on the B scale. That's opposite 124. So you're only indicating 106. And the actual speed of the airplane is 124. I had a pilot, a commercial pilot one time, absolutely surprised me one day when they asked, they told me rather, they said, these airplanes are old. That book was for a new airplane because this thing only goes 105. And I know that we're going fast. We should go faster than 105. And, and, and I, I, I didn't know what to do with myself for a little while because I thought, how did this person spend the last 240 hours in an airplane and not figure this out or not have somebody tell them. And then I went through the next 10 or 15 minutes and I explained it to them and it was like a light bulb went up in their head. Bing, wow, look at that, we got it, okay? So the airplane is actually going a little bit faster than what you show on that airspeed indicator, especially at higher altitudes, all right? Now, the next step, if I'm interested, which I might be, that I could do with this calculation is I could find my density altitude in the density altitude window. I just read up from the index and I find the density altitude about 10,400 feet. Now, I think they're stretching it by saying 10,400. I don't know that I can, that little bitty two lines right there, I don't know if you're gonna convince me that you can tell the difference between 400 and 500 feet. But yeah, I know it's between 10,000 and 11,000, right? I can see that. If you told me it was 10,500, I'd say, yeah, yeah, that's probably about right. I, I, I agree with you. 10,400, uh, unless you got you know, Superman vision, I doubt that you can tell that that's 10,400. All right, so this is your air density charts. This is how I'm using air density with the flight computer. Okay, wind. Let's talk wind. We're gonna discuss a whole nother side of this thing. If you have one of my paper flight computers, please hold it up to the wind side so the people in the back of the room can see it. Then I know that you, yep, yeah, that's the wind side. Yep, yeah, that's the wind side. You guys see it? We're gonna to go to the wind side real quick. I'm gonna go through a few slides kind of fast up here because navigation is next and we'll get back to it. But on the slide, I show the purpose of us doing this. We talked about an airplane flying in steady state in relative wind. So the wind ref only relative to the motion of the airplane. And we started discussing a little bit, what if that atmosphere was moving slightly with relationship to the ground? It behaves the exact same as a boat would going across a river or a stream. 
Here, I have current coming from the left. If my boat points directly towards the dock and begins to move in that direction, it is moving directly towards the dock, but it will end up downstream. The airplane will do the same thing. And I don't want to fly all the way to where I want to go and then have to make a turn and fly upwind to get there, okay? I want to fly a relatively straight line between two points, the shortest distance. So this is an example of somebody constantly adjusting that angle and pointing the boat or pointing the craft always at the dock as they go. This is called homing. They're continuing to go across, but they're homing towards it. Again, not a straight line, a terrible way to fly, terrible way to... Uh, you adjust the course just like so. This is what we want to do. No, no, the, previous. the previous one? Yeah, this one, they're just constantly pointing the nose at the dock. They're adjusting that course all the way. They're con they just keep it right in front of them the entire way. This one, they've predicted using a computer, how much of an angle do they need to point into the stream? How much of an angle do they need to point into the wind? All right, airplane, same thing. No wind, no drift. I don't like that they put a road here, but that's fine. Just give me something to look at. So here I got wind. This is the heading, which is very important. And this is described as the course. If that was my desired course, this is perfect. But if my desired course was straight up and down, I'm not achieving that goal. If my desired course was straight ahead, now what I want to do is adjust my heading, the same thing, so that I get that course, okay? Remember the difference between heading and course. Pilots use those two terms inter interchangeably, and, and that's another one that just kind of crawls up my skin. I'll hear a pilot saying, well, I need to fly along this heading. Ugh, I don't understand, why did you just say heading? You don't even know what the wind is gonna be that day. You need to fly that course. That course is the straight line across the ground that I try to achieve, okay? So taking a look, here's your intended course. There's the wind, and here's the actual ground track. Let's use the flight computer to figure out how it affects the ground track and how it affects my speed, my ground speed. A little bit of headwind, well, I got a little bit of help from mother nature. Something is adding to my performance. A little bit of, uh, oh, correction, a little bit of tailwind, it's adding to my performance. A little bit of headwind, and it's taken away from my performance. All righty, <clears throat> wind correction angles. Course is the intended path, the ground with respect to north. Course could be true course, or course could be magnetic course. Either way. Really? Heading is the direction the airplane is pointing. With no wind, or direct heading and course are the same. It's, it's almost never that you'll have no wind. Crosswind component and headwind component, I can find with the wind vector, and you just follow the six steps. The six steps on this flight computer. So, everybody, if you would, just follow along. The very first step, read please, what that very first step here is on the flight computer. And you can put that one so it's on the wind side. It's probably set your, true, your, your wind direction under the true course. Am I correct?
we have these classes in Sky Eagle Aviation Academy. Check out please our website www.atp.academy for details. Uh -oh, uh oh, what's going on? Oh man, every time we need a little bit of feedback, this is where it's falling for. What are we doing? What's step one? Perfect. When direction under true index. Okay. Remember we did this earlier. We said, Hey, I had some, some, uh, ground speed that we were going to calculate for, but we said there was no wind. Let's go back through and, and change this just a little bit. So follow along with me for a moment. I'm going to have wind at two, four, zero degrees at 30 knots. Okay. And we are going to fly a course of 163. True airspeed stays the same. We're not going to change true airspeed. We're going to make that the exact same. So let's follow the steps and the steps are on your true index set 240. Just rotate your true index until you get 240. Do you see the center dot? Slide the computer, the part with the instructions, slide the computer, and you guys can do the exact same thing on your, on your charts. Slide the computer until the center is over 100. Now, mark up from the beginning, mark up from the center, mark up 30 and place a nice little dot with your pencil. If you're using the computer from the app, here's how you have to do it. You have to place 240 under the true index. So 240, okay? and then slide this until I get to 100 and then mark up until I get to 30. So 10, 20, 30. Okay. Well, easy. The 100 came from, if I show 100 in the bottom, it makes it easy for me to find 30. You could put any number you want down there, but you have to mark 30 up from that number. 100 makes it nice and easy. Okay. All right. So we are on step two, correct? Mark a dot at the wind velocity. Okay. Now, step three, I am pretty sure if you guys look at step three, tell me if I'm wrong or you read it straight out loud, you slide your true course under the true index. Is that correct? Step three, I'm going to slide the true course under the true index. I'll show you here once, take your true course and place it under the true index. What do I have? 163. So go to 163. Right there. Okay. For those of you that are with me so far, this is where it's going to be just a little bit of a pinch. And if you're not where I am so far, you're not going to learn flight computers today. Okay. So, so far, if you're there, now what I want you to do is where that mark is, I want you to slide this until you have your true airspeed just under that mark. So I see 120 here. I'm going to slide so my dot is just over 120. You see the 120 line? I'm going to slide it so that 120 is just there. Okay. 
Now, step five and step six, that's what I call pure money. Those are the answers. Step five, I'm going to read the ground speed under the grommet. So the ground speed right under the center part of the wheel. And I read the wind correction angle from the center. This is a negative wind correction angle. That's a positive wind correction angle. So I'm showing ground speed 110, and I'm showing wind correction angle plus 14. Anybody get the same? So, so now the question is, we got the answers, right? So now the question is, what do I do with these answers? Well, I have a true course, 163. I have to add 14 to that. And that gives me my true heading, all right? The very next chapter, we are gonna go into true heading, magnetic, calibrated heading, everything else. So far, if we got what we, and the next chapter is, is pretty quick. Is number one, I typically lose about 80% of the people at this point in time. Here's why, because they just, at one point in time, it wasn't gonna work for them, okay? Now, in 1989, 1990, 1991, if you didn't know how to use a flight computer, your chances of soloing the airplane were absolutely that much. You were not gonna do it, okay? All of a sudden, they have computers, iPads, everything else. Do I need to know this information? I need to know the information. Do I need to know how to use this tool? Not really, yes sir. It would be a negative. Yeah, it would be a negative. That's correct. All right, so let, let's keep the momentum. I like where we're going now. Here we go. This goes through the remainder of the steps that we did earlier. I'm going to take that ground speed now and I'll place it right there on my speed index and I'll use it for every other calculation that we just now did. What I could also do with this, and if you guys follow me for a moment, I could do something that I've only had maybe 12 students ever be able to do this, and it was really cool. And that was, remember when we had that distance that we knew? We flew that distance that we knew, and they timed it. They knew the course because they measured it on the chart. They knew the heading because we measured it with a magnetic compass and they were able to backtrack using that same thing that we just did, determine the winds that were affecting the airplane, not the winds aloft forecast that we had over here, but the actual winds that were affecting the airplane, and then they were able to put it back through the same side and determine what the wind speed was. Could you do that? Yes. Could we do that tonight? I'm saying positively no, all right? It's not gonna happen. And that's okay, all right? Okay. Uh, first step, plot and forecast wind. This is how you forecast the wind, you plot it, all right? Remember I said earlier that we were gonna get to a point where it showed us about the nautical miles and so forth? There it is. All those distractors on the outside, there they are. Line up fuel with pounds and empirical gallons, that's fine. Find fuel weight, depending on what, how much you think your airplane fuel weighs. By the way, Avgas, just so you guys know, six pounds per gallon. So if I have 30 gallons, take that, multiply it times six, you got, what is that then, 180? 180 pounds? All right, fair enough. Chapter's over. 